no when it comes on here. Aha, we're live. Today's guest speaker is Justin Soltani. He is the technology officer of Zeta Partners. He can tell you more about himself. Uh, this is a company that has been in business since 1996, doing uh, a very strategic logistics work. Um, Justin is a graduate of Oregon State University, has a degree in mathematics and a degree in business. And um, today's topic, as you can see, is technology for assessment of mileage, weight, and congestion taxation. So I will hand it over to Mr. Sultani. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, we are a small company based out of Portland. And our partners combined, we have 100 years of experience in transportation, logistics, and waste industry. And we've consulted for companies such as FedEx, DHL, USPS, on the waste side with waste connections, defined by industries. And our prime focus has always been in transportation and technology. And we got into the business of mileage-based Actually, by accident, we were asked by Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates to design a system for them to track vehicles, assess taxations, fuel tax, and also um, speeding. And in case of an emergency, for them to be able to shut down the entire city's vehicle system. And as we progressed through here, we had an opportunity to present to ODOT on the discoveries that we did by looking at the systems in Europe, especially with England and their congestion-based taxation, and also what Oregon was planning to do. As you know, the governor made some announcements that Oregon will be $1.3 billion short for state highway funds, and also looking at the taxation on gasoline to go up by two cents. And here's some facts. Or um, California neighbors, 63, uh, 63 cents per gallon tax. Oregon is at 43.4. Washington, 54.4. Alaska, 26.4, which is the lowest. California being the large, Alaska the lowest. And you can see how the breakdown is based upon local taxation, state, and federal. Why the issue has come up with mileage-based taxation? Demand for fuel is elastic. Higher the fuel cost, less you drive. And since um, we get the introduction of biofuels and I have neighbors that actually make their own fuel, there is no taxation based. So let's look at mileage based taxation. Uh, 2008 Toyota Prius is now giving on an average 46 miles to the gallon. Um, counterpart Honda, 42 miles to the gallon. And the governor is now pushing that Oregon to be part of the future economies to be going to electric vehicles. As you can see on the graph, as the price of gas went high, the mileage driven across the country fell dramatically. Top line shows the cost per gallon and then mileage. more fuel efficient vehicles are being introduced. 19, in 1999, the average consumption of a car, city was 17, highway 21. Now, the 2008-2000 model of Toyota is giving 48 city, 45 um, highway. People are changing their habits. We're going to scooters, electric, cars, and there's also a commercial aspect to this. Commercial vehicles have or always been taxed on mileage, if the taxation, international fuel tax agreement, and now weight is becoming an issue because they are the, the bad guys in destruction of roads, heavy vehicles. Is the public ahead of the game? Well, the Flintstones had it right, they were trotting all over, saving the environment with foot pedal. On the commercial side, it's been ahead of the game. There has been companies out there, Qualcomm, Trimble, Telegis, Fatilla, Fleetmind, Discrete Wireless. They have provided technology in the commercial arena. 
track mileage, track um, driver behaviors. How many miles did I drive in one state versus the other one? I pay a fuel tax on it. Now we're starting to hit the public arena. What is the technology? Commercial side, nobody cared. Big Brother is watching. They're commercial vehicles. Doesn't impact me. I get my UPS mail in the morning and I'm fine. Now the public, what's happened? Do you care where I've been? Yes. Technology that we've worked with has been RFID, looking at passive active tags. We've worked with wireless technologies, cellular technology with Sprint, AT&T, and also right now we're investigating the use of Zigbee, which is a different wireless technology. What is the best technology to use in this market? How do we track a vehicle? What's the best way of getting this information back to the main headquarters for the calculation? And here's your bill. Other considerations that we came to the system is great. So this is the mileage you drove. Here's your bill. But what about the congestion tax? What about air quality tax? Can I tell you as the public, well, air quality is bad today. So if you drive today, I will charge you an extra penny for the times you drove. Emission controls, DEQ. How can we automate DEQ that you don't have to wait in line at the station? Can we automate this through this technology? Special fees. Can the city, state, federal impose special taxes on highways on the fly, saying Highway 217 is construction fees? City planner can go in, draw a, what we call a geofence, a line across the map, saying, okay, any vehicles entering this zone will now be taxed today. On the weekends, no, 8 to 5, 5 to 7, 7 to 9, special taxes on highways, freeways, roads. So when, with all this technology and being able to calculate, there has to be a vehicle component. So we looked at different technologies and we came up with our own system. We called it Terra, and basically with a mobile communication system, it has GPS, it has the capability of having cellular on board, or 802.11 wireless for transmission of data. Our system was based on multi-platform where rather than being able to push all the calculation power to a state agency, the unit itself could do certain calculations and basically trans transfer the information to a pump, to a device on the street, or even connecting to your cell phone through Bluetooth, transmit the information back and forth. The unit also had the capability of being able to attach to the diagnostics of the vehicle. What is the advantage for the public? Well, how many of you have driven and you see that little light flashing check engine, check engine? Nobody has a clue what it is. Take it in, well, here's a bill for $100. Please tighten up your gas cap. Thank you. So with this system, we say, okay, well, the general public can actually go in there and see what their car is doing. What is the quality of the air filter? Oh, now it's time to change it, not at 3,000 miles. Or check engine light, oh, it does really need to be fixed. Now I can proactive take it in. Also, um, for GM, Ford, Toyota, they're able to, with this system, be able to pass new firmware to your car as needed, rather than, this is a recall, please take your car in. Oh, by the way, you need a firmware upgrade. Um, Abu Dhabi was very interest in the backup system. Cellular is great, wireless is great. Well, what happens if something happens? What happens if the satellites collide? What happens if the cell becomes too congested and out of signal, out of range? We developed a highway monitoring RFID wireless system that basically attaches in certain locations. As the vehicle passes, it says, this is vehicle ID 1234 and all this information is downloaded. It also helped them to track number of vehicles entering a road or even at locations for automated speed. The key factor for them was is, here's a search of highway. I enter at this time, I left at this time. Well, if you made it between these two points on this average speed, guess what, you just got a speeding ticket automatically and you get it on your cell phone. Thank you very much for contributing to the state. Here's your bill. Don't do it again. So with a key factor of what next? The system can also be used for automated pull, um, tolls, parking meters, 
And another factor somebody asked us to do was, can this thing be used as a way of doing charging stations for electric vehicles? We plant it in, we have wires attached, and as the vehicle pulls in, we know who the ID is, yes, charge your vehicle. This was an example of, uh, uh, we did for ODOT. Map of the city, you can actually go and do geofences. Each red line is a geofenced area. Since the device is satellite-based, GPS-based, we know when the vehicle entered that zone and left that zone. While you're in that zone, on other mileage or time basis, you could be charged a tax. Different areas would have different special taxes. For example, as I said, Highway 217. You can draw a geofenced area around it and say from 8 to 5, if you enter this per mileage, you will pay this much special tax for upkeep of the road. Even down to the block level around PSU. No vehicles allowed to enter. If you enter, there will be a $12 surcharge. When you, walk it, when you enter that zone again, it records it in the system, and you are able to get a fee. Works the same way for parking. We know exactly when you enter the zone, and if the vehicle is stationary for X period of two minutes, you are parked. If you have a moved for an hour, you're parked, automatically you get billed rather than having to find the booth. Is my credit card working? Do I have change? And if you go over your limit, you automatically get your parking ticket. $35 over one hour. How does this information get back and forth? Well, where were the charges going to be charged to you? At the gas station. This was an ODOT and everywhere else seemed to be interested in the gas pump. Initially, the device would track the mileage you drove, but there was an issue was, how do you tie the vehicle to the pump? We started investigating, investigating, and said, well, we need to have a handshake system. Basically, here's the mileage I drove, great. Now, with manufacturers placing an RFID tag, and Lithium Motors actually has done this in the past three years. All the vehicles they sell actually have an RFID tag in, when you drive into their bases, thank you very much for buying a car from us, Mr. Smith. Please wait 15 minutes in aisle two and your car will be ready for an oil change. Same principle. As the vehicle is purchased and RFID tag is installed, the ID gets registered with the DMV. As you come into a gas station, the RFID technology handshakes with the pump saying this is you. And then information from your GPS units downloaded into the system calculates how much fees you have to pay for the mileage driven or special fees and when you finish at the pump you get your bill. Your fill information, location of your last purchase, mileage driven and special fees. Congestion fee, you enter zone 1, zone 2, highway 217 charges, EPA charges, green fees, you drove a Prius, you deserve a credit. You drove an SUV, your congestion, your emissions is higher, extra fee. How does the network diagram of the system? Every vehicle has a GPS unit built on board. We calculate the GPS locations as you drive. We know your mileage. We transmit that information to a ground station, which then calculates all information and as, as you go to the gas station, pass it on. On the scales measurement, there was a question, should the public pay for oversized vehicles? They do more damage to the roads. Why not? So based on your gross vehicle weight, you could also get a special fee. Heavy duty trucks, LTL, line hauls, trash vehicles, we already measured them. But this was another way of being able to real-time transmit this information to a ground station and calculate the special fees. And if you have any questions, please. Biggest factor we saw was the commercial vehicles. They're um, running all over the country. Right now, they're on IFTA fuel taxation. Calculations are based upon odometer readings. and. When we were doing our studies, we found out that great system, 
every every quarter the hauler reports. This is the number of mileage I drove. This is the states I went into. They fill out the form, and then mail a check in or get a refund back. Well, as we were going through our audits and trying to help some haulers understand what's going on, the thing we noticed was a lot of these trucks have just bad od odometer readings. Or they are using retread tires, which makes the length higher so the rotation is different. And the system can just be manipulated, and the states are getting their money every quarter. So you do all the work, you enter the information in, and at the quarter, they enter their, their check, the reports back to you. Weight calculations. Well, <coughs> some had automated scales. Well, the guy's tired. He wants to go as fast as he can. He just drives through, as, through the scales and registers the weight. We came back. The weights could be off anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. Well, orange means slow down. Well, hey, I don't have time. I'm just going to go straight through. London had a system where as the vehicles went through a certain zones, cameras would capture the number plates. We tried that in certain locations. Works great if the vehicle is going at a certain speed. London, everything was going at 5, 10 miles an hour. We tried it here. As the vehicles were going through, raining Oregon, we couldn't read anything. So another thing of this was basically for ODOT was the trucking side. What do we need to do on the trucking side, on the commercial vehicles, to change how they do business? Look at rather than doing IFTA every quarter, look at every week. Look at weight mileage taxation differently for them. Manage enforce safety. Drivers are allowed to drive only certain mileage by installing a system like this for the states to monitor. Now they know exactly what this driver did. If you go and look at transportation, they're already doing this internally. But now this is at the state level to monitor this. How much mileage? Driver logs, what materials are you carrying? This is an example of an automated scale that we proposed. They're on the free freeway. They have, um, each vehicle has an RFID. There's a camera system that counts the number of axles. And as you go through, it says, trucker one, you have three axles. Your weight is here. Here's your tax. And basically, the hauler is sent a bill. Enhanced mapping. So if you have the general public, you have your GPS unit on board. But what about the state vehicles, the snow plows, trash trucks, everything else? Well, this was a way of we were presenting even for Dubai and Abu Dhabi. If you install this on your own vehicles, then you can manage them. In case of an emergency, OK, this is Highway 226 is congested. Take an alternative route. How do I get to point A, point B faster? Here's the map of our city. This is what's going on now, real time. If you've been on KATU, everything else, traffic cam, here's how congested you are. Well, if the city vehicles had this, now you can better monitor what's going on. How to get the fire units faster. How um, Police vehicles, where are you? Um, Emmanuel has an emergency, divert to OHSU. Any questions? Vehicle routing and identification. As part of the system was, how do you make the commercial or even the public better? Well, I need to know uh, what the parking situation at PSU is. Well, if all, all the vehicles have the sensory information on board, as I come to a close, you can say, OK, I need to be at PSU at this time. The system says, oh. 6 and Mill Street, there is parking available five spots. You're informed on your cell phone. And as the spots come available, I'm sorry, nothing available, there's more here. Vehicles can be monitored, special delivery pickups. As you drive by, the city can actually now route vehicles. Uh, UPS, slow down because there's a FedEx truck in front of you at um, Pearl District. Parking is not available, don't slow down the traffic, slow down. 
air traffic control, basically for tra commercial transportation. Law enforcement. As the vehicle comes, the, this was the big thing for Middle East. As the police officer comes to the vehicle, all the information from the back number plate is transmitted. This is the vehicle ID. is owned by Justin Soltani. No, he's not wanted, but he's beating. Pull him over, he's safe. If there's a vehicle stolen with the Zigbee technology within uh, 300 feet, the information is transmitted, slow down. Something going on, ask for backup. Or automatically through the road sensors, this vehicle has been stolen, here's where it is continuously. A lot of the thing was, let's put the um, RFID technology in the gas tanks. If you steal a vehicle, what are you going to do? Take the gas tank off? Or in some cases, was even to put the technology into the tires of the vehicles. That way, for commercial vehicles, you can actually say the driver walked around with a wand and inspected every tire, came back through. If you went too fast, then, OK, you're not doing your job. This is how long it took for him to walk around the vehicle, came back. His inspection is done. Another factor for um, London was by having this technology in the vehicles, on the embassy sections or routes, if something happens, you can monitor the vehicle entering an embassy and start building a data warehouse of what the, this vehicle is doing, building habits. And if something is out of the ordinary, the system would then flag you saying, this is not within his norm. He always showed up here from 8 to 5, but now, for some reason, he's here at 12.30. This whole started with electric vehicles. Everybody wants to be green. How do we enforce taxation on vehicles that don't go to the gas pump? We looked at the system where you get charged on your cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. Go to the high school and first thing parents do, here's a cell phone for your kid. Everybody's got texting. So. If the vehicle is not going to the gas station, use the cell phone, use the utility bill in order to charge your fees. Or even when you have um, special stations er along the street for charging of the vehicles. Same system again is uh, for gasoline vehicles, monitors where you are, the mileage driven. Works the same for electric vehicles except the payment method will be different. And this was an example we did um, where they wanted the meters, automated meters with RFID technology to be, and also charging stations. You, uh, the meter recognizes the vehicle, the gasoline vehicle is therefore parking, or it's actually an electric vehicle and is charging and basically authenticates, yes, you are who you are, door opens, and they can pull, up, pull the plug and charge the vehicle. Same system then can be used. What's the motivation for the public to do this? Insurance companies. A pay-as-you-go system for insurance. Why pay eight, nine hundred dollars every six months for your vehicle? Now, exactly we know what you're doing. You're driving safely. You're always watching the speed limit. You drive truly how many miles? Oh, for the insurance company, 10,000. Really? No. Well, it's actually 22, but I wanted a cheaper rate. With this system then, yeah. I drive 30 miles a day. I'm a safe driver. Here's all the records. It's done by automated system. Here's how much your fee should be. Pay as you go system. You drive, you pay. The car sits in your driveway, it's fine. So an incentive for the public to embrace this system. For the city, command and monitoring system. What is really the health of the city? How's the congestion? How's the emergency statuses? How can, some, how can vehicles be deployed better? Can you now get on the radio and say, well, Highway 217 is truly a mess. Take I-5 North. 
Middle East was looking at this center as a way of, in case of an emergency, that they can enter a code in and disable all vehicles. Or during a certain hour, there's something going on, dignitary coming. If you enter this zone, basically with alarm, and you enter the code of GM vehicles, turn off ignition of vehicle, the vehicle basically will be brought to a standstill at a reasonable speed. Any questions? Public challenges. The minute everybody started talking was Big Brother is watching you. We are watching you. Everybody is watching you. How many of you have cell phones? And if you look at the top, you'll see a little GPS locator and everybody knows where you are. You call 911 and the first thing it says is, we know where you are, this is a locator. So how do you get the public to buy, to buy into such a system? Well, the roads is maintaining. Some of, the, some of this could go to the schools. Help this, help that. But everybody's paranoid of government is watching us. I'm watching you. You're watching me. Everybody's watching. Um, you, we all have cell phones. Our buy-in value was make, make the code the source code public, open source. Here's what the system does, calculus mileage. Let you as in individuals choose, um, I, like to have the, I, have, I would like to have a mapping feature that I can see where my car went. Sure, here's a service for you. You can go in, log into the ODOT website and say, oh, this is the mileage I drove, or with this enhancement, this is where my car went. Oh, I wasn't in my car. Or in case of an emergency, you have an uh, automated state OnStar program that I'm now standing still at the side of the road for more than where I should be. The state could dispatch a service vehicle to you. If you're a family member, family alone, wife, w children, you can actually go to the w a website saying, I'm alone, I'm traveling with my kids. If I'm standing still for more than six minutes, at somewhere on the side of the street, not taking the kids to the party, there's a problem, help me. System would then recognize that and say, hey, there is an issue, dispatch a police officer, is a par parent with ch children, alone. What would be the benefit of this, this system? Just for the state to collect taxation? No. You can check the diagnostics of your vehicle, check how your emission is. Is there a problem with my car? What do the codes mean? What does the check engine light mean? Is something wrong? Ford, GM, whoever can upgrade my firmware in my car to make it more efficient. So there are true values for the public. It's just how is the system being presented to the public? Not just as a mileage-based taxation, but there are some benefits to you. What we saw as the next step, and this came actually out of the Middle East, was we were looking into the mileage-based taxation, and they came back and said to us, well, your background is also in waste technology. Is there something that the state level or the, our government level can do in order to help the mileage-based taxation be an offset and help everybody else? Well, we looked into um, waste-to-energy plants for state-owned vehicles where waste is being presented into the system, again, producing electricity, being sold to, for example, in Oregon to PGE, and asphalt being used for ODOT. So some system, basically based on mileage system, as you have the trash trucks and everything else, but also what's the next step in, in this progression of the mileage way taxation, especially with landfills filling up. And this was a solution that we looked at for Middle East. Because big thing is we want electric vehicles. But how do we tax them? Well, here's the system. Oh, by the way, let's use that waste in order to charge our electric cars. Any questions? And I'm zipping through it. And the biggest thing is, what's the future going to bring with cars, vehicles, transportation?
Are you ready for, are the states, are, are, are we ready for the future? We've gone from gasoline vehicles, now back to electric vehicles. We're all having fun with less save the environment. But is the transportation, the infrastructure ready for it? What is the cost to us in order to charge your vehicle? How many of you like going more than 100 miles in a day camping? Is that electric vehicle going to be sufficient for you? How am I going to put four of my friends, all my drinks, my dog, my pet, and off we go on an Evo car camping? Well, every day we have to stop, charge the car, and off we go again. So the basis of this presentation was just a, at a discussion basis. Here's some technologies out there for monitoring mileage-based, weight-based, congestion-based taxation based on a simple device that goes inside of your vehicle, connects to your in a vehicle into an ODB2 connector. Inside of a truck is a J1708 that can monitor emissions. You can monitor your fuel usage. And here it is. The benefits to the public, you know. States collecting your taxes faster, alternative way, because we all want to be green. We all have cars that are now 40, 48 miles to the gallon versus the SUV that we drove at 12 to 15 miles. And here's how we're going to collect the taxes on it. But here's the infrastructure that's needed behind it. Today is great. The governor wants the electric cars. I would love to have one, but can I afford to keep charging it every 100 miles? We had a joke that, great, every 100 miles we'll have a whole bunch of cars, electric vehicles ready, and we the Pony Express. Finish 100 miles, jump into the next one, off we go again. In about five days, we'll be in Medford. A question uh, about the addressing privacy concerns. Do you think that um, offering opt-out options for people is a viable method to address those, or do you think that would compromise the, the system overall? Well, when we were initially designing the system, we were sitting here going, we are going to be one of the most hated people in this world. We looked at it was, well, here's the technology for it for the pri on the privacy side of it, but what, what logically would somebody do? If I raise the gas tax to $1 a gallon and give you the option of either you put this in here so we really know the mileage you drove and you save money, or here's going to be such an astronomical gas tax that I'm going to force you into it anyway. So it's one of those things is how comfortable are you? Either you're going to pay this astronomical sales tax on fuel, or let me just put this device in here and just report the mileage I, dr I drove. One of the key factors to the system was, so if you put special um, taxes on roads, you have Highway 217 and 99 crossing. How, how do you know which road are you on? This was one of the concerns for ODOT. Well, it was based on your heading. You look ahead and you look behind of you. Then it was basically, then again, the privacy issue was, where are you going? Should my wife or my husband be able to log in there and see what I'm doing? I'm at work. Oh, yeah, you're at the baseball game. Um, my question is, like, dealing with the uh, tax base issues for roadways at certain times during the day, uh, are you worried about, like, you know, urban congestion, people trying to go around those tax-based areas and then going more towards the uh, surface streets and clogging up like the neighborhood streets that way and what that was, do you do to cover those issues? That was the concern and basically through the system you can monitor how this is changing the pattern of people's behavior and where they're driving. So as you get off of 217 in order not to pay the tax by going on Canyon, and you start building another warehousing system of wait a minute by imposing this tax now for the city planners now people are going around it. But then you have the people that say, okay, now the congestions move somewhere else. Well, hey, well, if you move from here to here and you were going here, I want to geofence this round for you now and impose taxes on you because you were supposed to go 217. Other than the Middle East, have you implemented some or all of this uh, system in the U.S. especially? Oh, uh, this system actually was, we are actually flying back to the Middle East uh, to discuss it. This was just done as a prototype for them. 
they, every time we were asked to design a system, we designed it, and they wanted more and more bells and whistles. They, I mean, they wanted the grandfather of systems, from cameras to GPS to shut off vehicles to even for the city be able to control how commercial vehicles are um, delivering goods. I don't want to suddenly have all these vehicles behind each other stacked up in one parking spot delivering their goods. Let me air traffic control them, slow down, send a message to them saying stop at this traffic light or stop, pull over here, let this guy finish and then move on. Please. One of the key problems with the, uh, the GPS system is that the uh, initial cost and the operating costs tend to be greater than the revenue that's being collected uh, from the systems. And so what's the cost of your system and the operating cost? Um, the modems, depending on our proposal for the states and everybody, else, that here are the, the modems which are in the 50 to $100 range, but let the consumer choose the level of service that they want. Do you want a unit that just tracks your mileage? Do you want a unit that checks your diagnostics of your vehicle? Do you want a unit that shows where you are or to the point of installing in the vehicle, where, how safe are my kids, being able to govern the speed of your vehicle? Through the diagnostics, you have that, in, that ability to go in there and actually set the speed parameters. So it was more, more for us was let the public choose the level of the modem or of the device they want in their vehicle, from the basic to the Cadillac. And then the operational cost was for us was here's the back end solution, but let the state run it. Is there is the state owned system? So the cost of the hardware, everything else falls on basically back on the taxpayer. We could, depending on on the participation, we could never estimate what is the horsepower or the disk space needs. Should, the, should we keep the information for five years so you can go back and say, I wasn't on this road, let me map where I've been and I prove that I wasn't even in this country. Or after 30 days, here's your bill, the minute you pay your bill, the information is wiped. That issue became of how of data retention because if you calculate with two million vehicles constantly reporting, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, what is the data retention period? Financially, five to seven years. But for this information, how long? Operational cost was here's the computer system, here's the back end databases to collect the data. But again, for the state, what should be the data retention? <clears throat> Um, I was wondering, when is the prototype you mentioned might take a place in, in real life? Within how many years? Um, we are actually um, trying to get the prototype ready for Abu Dhabi in the next two months. Please. I'm with the idea of um, we watch you or everybody under surveillance and information are public. Is there a concerns or issues behind that gonna build up? Like if I wanna watch anybody, then I can just find anybody I want to, right? Um, the proposal for our system was that as you purchase your vehicle or you go to a installation area to have this device installed in your vehicle, that you would log onto a website and say, I am Joe Smith, and you enter an encryption code and the data pertaining to you and your car and your modem is now encrypted only for your eyes, except when a calculation is done at the back end for the calculation of the mileage. There is one thing as where, where am I going, where have I been, where's how many miles did I drive. For the states and everywhere else was, here's the mileage that I drove, but not where I have been. If you choose to have that information that you can view your vehicles, where your kids have been, and it's an encrypted data that you go into the database and you say, now map my points, but only accessible to you, and then you can purge that information out. Please. Uh, you point out the challenges of the system related to the data management and those things. Um, do you think our current communication infrastructure can handle these billions of transactions each day? The amount of data that was going back and forth is so small that we believe through cell carriers the information can be transmitted with no issues. 
there is so much excess capacity right now on the cell carrier side. Certain countries actually wanted the backup system of, I want the information to go twice, and then we'll compare it, and then say, here's what I need to keep as a backup. And Abu Dhabi, UAE, was happy to have the, the full bells and whistles of, I want cellular communication, I want satellite communication. When I go into the desert, I want to be able to transmit. When it came down to Oregon, um, and um, Europe was, how should the information go? Should I use a cell network? Then the question is, as you mentioned, came up, who's going to pay for the cell service now? Who's going to have this cost of, now I need to transmit this information real time? And, well, let's do wireless, because you see on top of the um, traffic towers, there is wireless mesh network being deployed. Well, that's meant for emergency vehicles and everything else. Should the general public be able to capture this information through that system. So the question then again comes up, well, how is this data going to be transmitted? Do we go and deploy these pods all over 217? At some point, your car will hit it and you'll transmit that information or just collect it at a gas station. Then the question again came, electric vehicles never go to the gas station. So the whole method for Oregon and the US, bless you, has been how do we transmit this inf information back? Do we use your cell phone? I mean, you're paying for the minutes already. Should we just tap onto it through Bluetooth? Should we tell that everybody in Oregon using the system needs to have a Bluetooth accessible cell phone? What about uh, cars coming from other states? How do you plan to deal with that? Middle East was no problem. They said every vehicle, um, 285,000 vehicles for Abu Dhabi, Dubai was 312,000. We want them all. Then for Oregon, when we were looking at the system, yeah, so you have California, you have Washington, you have Canadians, you have everybody driving through. How are you going to do that? Well, raise the fuel tax. Rather than being at 42 cents, make it 70 cents. Privilege of driving through Oregon. It's it's one of those things. If you're an Oregonian, here's your privilege of having this device in your vehicle. If you're from out of state, we got you. Have you, uh, have you looked at the Dutch model? Uh, my understanding is they're going with like a, a nationwide um, congestion pricing scheme and was wondering about how they transmit data or planning on transmitting data. Actually, we saw the RFP for Netherlands, and it was very interesting because it was based on cameras and also on wireless technology. Um, as I understand, it's not been deployed in Netherlands. It's still under um, bidding. But that was the last I read the RFP on it, and that was about, a, I think the RFP request had to be in by February for the deployment of it. You talk about the possibility of zone pricing and stuff. Um, a couple questions related to that. One is I assume it tracks where their vehicle's moving because you don't want to get charged when your vehicle's parked in the driveway. Um, but the other is, is there any kind of warning you're about to enter a zone where you're going to get slapped with a huge fee? I mean, that's one of the things I used to hate about old long distance service. You could rack up these bills you didn't see until the end, end of the month. One of the systems basically was that as you enter a zone, you would get a SMS text on your phone saying you're about to enter this zone, the taxation is this much for this period. So we had a notification system or for even for commercial vehicles that have a navigation system on board that will notify them saying you are about to enter this. Certain vehicles like BMW and uh, believe Lexus had the ability through the GPS to receive two-way communication if that was enabled. But the biggest problem we had, and again, we are just a solution, was so everything is great. We deployed the system. And tomorrow, um, this gentleman becomes the governor and says, I want everybody to use a hands-free kit. Nobody's allowed to use their cell phones while driving. Well, here we're sending SMS to you. You're about to hit the zone, and you can't do anything about it. There's a plus and a negative side to each, each thing that we look at. We will notify you as long as you're able to look at that notification. But where is this device located in the vehicle? Couldn't it have a display of its own rather than having to be through a cell phone? Some of us don't have texting. <laughs> don't want it. 
that was your that was your choice whether you that was your choice the device itself is the size of um, a cigarette box and it can be located anywhere in the vehicle if you wanted a display unit are you willing to pay for it then you have a display of a tom tom or a Grumman unit from Costco that has it and if you look at the Gar Garmin unit or the tom tom it does have two way capability if you attach it to a cell phone Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned London, and I was thinking Singapore. How extensively did you study these countries? And if so, what was the most problematic or contested um, uh, topic about implementing their systems? Well, the, the one thing interesting with Europe, uh, with, actually with London, was everybody was so used to CCTV, they didn't care. It was like, we, we can, I know where you are. Let me show you where you're walking through. Oh, you went down on the way here, here you are again. People didn't care. Everybody got so used to it that here's the system. We're going to watch you. Fine. You're already watching me anyway. And the biggest, the biggest interesting thing we found out was when you get, get to London, you stop by the little place. You buy a nine pounds little magazine that says tells you where all the cameras are on the freeway, and tells you exactly when to slow down. So if you're driving through, you said, "Oh, I'm on M40, mile marker 12. Slow down to 55." Okay, after you hit 14, you can speed up to 90 again. And basically what we looked at was how our research was, what is the best system that we can build for our client, which was develop a system for the Middle East. So we looked at basically Oregon, what Oregon is trying to do with Oregon State and also I believe with PSU for a while, and also take a look at what London is doing. London, everything was based on cameras. Let me just take a snapshot of your number plate as you enter a zone. And there's some companies right now that are making the camera system. We looked at camera system from FLIR. They were, the, they were Oregon based, great, local company, we can deal with them. Camera units are expensive. Now you're talking about sending a GPS location, versus now let me send you an image of, there's my face, there's my number plate, constantly every location with a date timestamp. How am I going to keep calculating this information and how, much, how long am I going to keep it? A selling point for them was, well, I can see you, your number plate, are you wearing your seatbelt? So they built a recognition system for value add. Let me see if your seatbelt is on. Let me check inside of your vehicle from the side angle, is there a kid in the front seat? If the height is not here, then it records you, here's you, here's your kid, and here's the number plate, here's your bill. So a lot of the systems out there right now are imagery based, whereas here's the modem inside your vehicle. We looked at the solution of, um, if you look at all the delivery vehicles, everybody has a Nextel cell phone. I can go and deploy a Nextel cell phone or cell phones to everybody, you have it active. If you're in a vehicle, I can track where you are. We had a case where we deployed on a trial, 70 i700 Nextels. We got them back with all of them lined up and they, they drove over the phones, they packed it up and the driver shipped them back to us. Or we had a cases where the drivers would take the cell phone, put tin foils around them so they wouldn't be able to be tracked. And we kept telling you, this is just a demo, we're just trying something out. The vehicle had at roads in there, but the guy was more worried about we know where he is versus the vehicle. We're like, you are with the vehicle. You're a delivery driver. You got the phones back, but the at roads still show where the truck went. I mean, the, the simplicity of the code is, here's the GPS location, here's the next GPS location, here's the mileage I drove. It's just the calculation. It can be done on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet. The whole behind this um, open sourceness comes of it is, do you want to know where you are on a map? Then that's basically the privilege to you and your information only. But just to calculate mileage, it's just a calculation. There's no, nothing glamorous about it. But it's what can that information do? I can start building trends. If you, as a pro, um, I'm mean, throwing it out, just start calculating your mileage and your GPS coordinates, download it into a data warehouse, 
and start looking at your habits. On a good day, sunny day, I want to get home, I start speeding up. On a bad day, I don't want to get to class because he's going to give me bad marks. I'm just going to drive very slow and miss that class. If you data warehouse that GPS information, you start learning a lot about people's habits. That becomes the key factor on it, especially for insurance companies. Are you a safe, good driver? Um, I was just wondering if you um, tried any ways of providing incentives for like carpooling for multiple people in a single vehicle. Um, that again, we just provider of the technology and the solution that's really up to the states. When we first started investigating this technology and started building of I it, mean, our, our whole thing was the next age of how about we have these smart vehicles? How about now we have um, 10 vehicles that are able to join each other like a train, go down the freeway? 100 miles an hour on the fast carpool lane, you know you want to go from here to Medford, you have this location in here, we can guide the vehicles in a safe distance, go for it. Everything worked fine, we were testing it, we were having, enjoying this whole project of we have hit the jackpot. Next thing we know, a deer jumped in the road and guess what? How are you gonna slow these cars down now? Everybody, first car smashes, everybody else right after each other. Please. There's a question from a web viewer. Um, and you've talked about the vehicle diagnostics aspects, and one uh, question is, could you envision a system where the onboard diagnostics could substitute for a, a physical inspection by the, the DEQ here in Oregon, for example, for emissions? Yes. If you go to the DEQ, they do exactly what onboard diagnostics does. They open up your jack, they plug in the cable, and they basically run your car at a certain RPM, and it shows you what your emissions are. This system does the same thing on a real-time basis. One of the parts for congestion taxation was that depending on whether you're on a freeway or in town, you could get taxed differently in London based upon your diagnostics. How much emissions did you put out in the central London versus eastern corridor? There's another web question about uh, delinquency. So you talked about how people you know, use aluminum foil or, or hack the system, but is that, have, have you thought through kind of the process for dealing with that? For enforcement? Well, our recommendation was if a unit is not responding within X period of time and we have backup systems such as the RFID readers at certain locations that you notify either a traffic entity that there is a problem that needs to be fixed or have regular inspection of the system when you go to a DEQ or to your car dealership, the unit is checked and verified for functionality and correctness. The biggest thing for a certain commercial vehicle with, a diag with the engine diagnostic was they like to know exactly how many miles or hours that engine did for serviceability. We had some cases with a commercial fleet. I won't name the carrier. It's expensive to have a truck out to be serviced, oil changed, back on the road. Well, if I lease the vehicle for one year or two years on a Freightliner, Volvo, Kenworth, why would I want to do the service on it? Is leased, it goes back, I don't care. I'm not spending the money to oil change it. Company delivered back 1,200 vehicles. They, they were, after three years, every engine was destroyed. They never did the maintenance on it, prevented the maintenance. It's leased, why should I? Leasing companies came back and said, let's put it, our device is commercial, we have to monitor it, we leased it to you, we're gonna do the diagnostics. If you get so many hours and you don't show up, you violated your lease and we can fine you. So there's pluses to that diagnostics information, one for the DQ, for the public, but also for the companies to make sure those trucks, I mean, all you want is driving with your family and you see a 56,000 pound truck coming towards you with no oil changes and who knows what's gonna happen to the brakes. Uh, you mentioned that it was a state-run system or would be a state-run system, um, what would we be required to monitor this kind of system? What kind of infrastructure, what kind of um, program would need to be to handle all this data and provide the services that you mentioned? We, I mean, from our side, we, 
we are the solution. I mean, we are the solution provider. If you have to build it, the more bells and whistles, it looks great for us. But it's one of those cases that actually makes sense for the universities to, for you, talk with the state. Okay, let's actually look at the backend infrastructure needed to support this. How many people in this room want to know? I just want to pay with the mileage check. I don't care what my vehicle does. But what about the one individual that wants to know where the mapping is? Where have I been? Where have my children been? Who borrowed my car while I was on vacation in Maui? Then you're on a different level of support and needs and computing power. So that's one of the things that is basically for what we were trying to propose for the state is, it's great, you want a technology, you want this, fine. But how about you engage the universities to do a research on what do people really want? If, if here's the level of the hardware or the level of mapping or the level of support, what do people want? Would they go for the cheapest solution, just pay the mileage tax? Or do they really care about their diagnostics of their vehicle and how well the vehicle is doing and where have I, where have I been? And then build the infrastructure to support that rather than let's go down this path and then find out now we want all the bells and whistles, the public wants this. Now what do we do? How do we retrofit this? I hope that answered your question. Yeah, have, you, have you put any thought into like say in Abu Dhabi, they want the full system. What kind of program would need to monitor that? It seems like it'd be a lot of manpower and a lot of technology for a state department to actually monitor and provide these services. Have you kind of put any thought into what big picture that would be? I mean, on the computing power is tremendous. We've, I mean, when we were scaling this thing and we were talking with Hewlett Packard, I've never seen a salesperson's eyes so big in my life. <laughs> I mean, we were talking about petabytes of data because they wanted to maintain five to seven years just to be able to see how the infrastructure is going, what the habits are, what people are, not what people are really doing, but how is how the roads being used, between what hours, how is the congestion, start really truly building an infrastructure of let me predict what 10 years is going to look like, what 20. Not like, okay, let's put two lanes on 26, oh shoot, after we're done, let's put three lanes. But let's build a, a model of what will happen. As we, are going to need, we know we're going to need so many internet connections, we know we know so many calculations, but what does it take? And again, well, when we were trying to price it out, it was like, well, here's the prototype, but when we go to 300,000 vehicles, seven years of data, this is not what's going to look like. Hopefully, by that time, Intel, IBM would have the computing system to be able to do the calculations. When do we do the calculations? Do we do it at night? Do we tell everybody, okay, nobody's allowed to drive from 2 to 4 a.m. while we do all the calculations? How do we back this system up? One calculation, we were at 10 petabytes. I'd like to um, I'd like to um, remind our viewers on the web to make sure you submit your questions. Uh, for the students in the audience who did not have the opportunity to ask questions, please uh, do the usual routine of writing them down and handing them to me before you leave. Um, if you did ask a question, uh, make sure that you see that I recorded um, a cue by your name here on the sheet, because I don't know all of your names, so I'm not, I may not have gotten one or two. And um, with that, our, our speaker for next week will be uh, Brian Lee, a, a doctoral candidate at University of Washington, who will be talking about the uh, influence of work and non-work accessibility on residential location choices within a microanalytic framework. And to conclude today's seminar, let's all thank um, Justin Sultani. Thank you.
Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. My name is uh, Ali Zahir. I'm, uh, I'm actually from Abu Dhabi. And that was very interesting.